So, you ready? Let's go through. One, two, three. Here's our equation. Step one, you don't have to write the steps, but I'm going to do it so I, I'm doing my check off this team. I want to find the y-intercept first, okay? So I'm going to write y-intercept. Uh, that's just my abbreviation. To find the y-intercept, what do I do? I just look at the value of c. What's the value of c in this case? Five. It's 5. The y-intercept is 5. That was not hard, okay? Next step, I want to find the x-intercept. So I'll write x intercepts. Okay. How do I find the x intercepts? I let y equal zero. You can see it there in red. Okay. So here's y. Let's make him zero. Okay. I get this equation: x squared plus six x plus five equals zero. You did these kinds of equations to death, right? In fact, this is a really easy one. Can anyone factorize it for me? X plus two and x plus three. Okay. Now think carefully. You got to be really. This is actually, it's slightly sneaky. Um, I'm looking for a pair of numbers that adds to something and multiplies to something. But which one's which? Do I want it to multiply to six or add to six? Hmm. In this case, I want it to add, right? And this is the number I want it to multiply by. Usually this number right here on the end, C, usually it's a bigger number. But as you can see, it's not always, okay? So that was a bit sneaky, right? I want two numbers that add to six multiply to 5, what am I going to choose? 5 and 1. 5 and 1. In fact, 5 is prime, so 1 and 5 are pretty much all I'm going to have, unless there's certs. Thankfully, there aren't. So 1 and 5 is what you told me. So 1 and 5 is what I'm going to stick in to my factorization. Okay? Now, I've factorized, but I haven't solved. I haven't solved. I want x equals. What are my two values? Negative 1 and negative 5. Fantastic. Okay, so let's just chuck that in. Okay, hey presto, I've done step two. I found the x-intercept, okay? Now, this last little step here, the axis and then the vertex, okay? So I'm gonna write step three, axis, okay? Um, remember I said, ooh, if you can't find any x-intercepts, that's okay, you can do this, okay? You can put x equals minus b on 2a. Let's just quickly try that and see what happens. x equals, what's b in this case? It's 6, very good. Negative 6. And then on the denominator, I have 2a. What's a in this case? 1. It's 1. It's hiding. I haven't written it there, but that's because multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything. So 2 times 1 is just 2. Okay. Now, this is a really simple fraction. I'll just simplify that. It's negative 3. Okay. But this shows us something which is kind of handy, which is a, another useful trick you can have up your sleeve. right? You can find the axis of symmetry without finding the roots. But if you find the roots, you've more or less found the axis of symmetry. Can you see why? Have a look. There's a relationship going on here, right? You look at these roots, and then you look at the axis of symmetry. What's the relationship between them? Symmetry. It's, it's bang in the middle, right? It's, in fact, it is the midpoint of the roots. That's exactly what you'd expect because it, it is, after all, the axis of symmetry. It's the part in the middle. It had better be in the middle, right? So, therefore, if you've got the roots, just, just take the value in between, take their average. Or you can do that. All right, now I said I want to use the axis of symmetry to find this guy, the vertex. Okay? Now, a vertex, or the vertex rather, um, it's a point, right? Like it's a point up here, or a, a point down here. Okay? I don't have enough to define where a point is, right? I need one extra piece of information. What do I need? If I've got an x, I'll need a y. I need coordinates, don't I? Right. So I need an x, and then I need a y, and then I'll know exactly where it is. Okay. So I will take that x value, the one you just found, the axis of symmetry, and I'm going to stick that guy, whoop, where he is, there, back into my original equation. Okay. I'm going to put the axis of symmetry into the equation, and that will hand me a y value. Okay. So let's give it a go. For the vertex. I'll say y equals, and I'm going to put in negative 3 everywhere I see x. Are you right with that? So let's just do a straight substitution. Watch your negative signs. It's really easy to forget to put a negative in there. You could appeal to your calculator to do this if you like. I think these numbers are easy enough we can do. Negative 3 squared. 9. Nine. Uh, 6 times negative 3. <laughs> Minus 18. 18. Very good. Plus 5. 
Okay? Uh, 9 minus 18, I can do that. That's negative, negative 9. And then I add 5, negative. which is negative 4. Okay? And again, your calculator can check that. So now, I have together with this x value, I have a y value. You put them together and you get coordinates. Namely, negative 3, negative 4. Okay. I've got all my clues. That's all the pieces I need. In fact, I'll just circle all of them in green. There's the y-intercept. There's the x-intercept. There's my vertex right there. Okay. So now I know where I need to draw this. Okay. For instance, do you notice uh, a whole bunch of these numbers are negative, negatives, negatives, all that kind of thing. So that tells you where on the graph you're going to need to be. And then I've got my y-intercept, which is positive. It's 5. Okay. So because I know what this graph looks like already, and we've got these values in our heads, let's draw our set of axes like this. <coughs> okay. Now, do you see, and I will help you see it right in a second if, you, if it's not immediate to you, do you see why I've drawn my axes in a funny way? Like, I've hardly got any values over here. Right? And the reason why is because when I think horizontally in terms of the x-axis, um, I don't have any positive values. I don't have, I don't have one positive x value. Right? Um, this is positive, but it's a y value. Negative, negative, negative. So everything's really the business end of this parabola is having it over here. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, let's put all the values we've got. Let's put them on the graph. We'll go through them in order. Y-intercept is 5. So if I go... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, bang. That's where I am. Okay. Because you're going to put a whole bunch of marks on here onto this set of axes, I tend to indicate the places where I go through, these guys, I put X's. Okay. Question? Yes, you can. All right. Y intercept. Check. X intercept. I'm on my X axis now. I need negative one and negative five. Okay. So I'm going to do this. One, two, three. Four, five. There's one there, negative one. And there's the other one over there, negative five. Okay? Now, just worth noting, I have um, made my vertical scale and my horizontal scale, I've made them more or less identical. I mean, it's not, you, didn't, you saw, I didn't get a ruler out or anything, um, but it's close enough, okay? You probably should try to get them as close as you can, but if you get some ridiculous numbers, like suppose I found this is negative one, this is negative 5, and then when I crunch the numbers, I got a y-intercept of 200, okay? Please don't draw your 200, like, you know, um, you piece together three pieces of paper so I can make it up there. Or, in the same way, don't make this 200 and then think, oh, holy cow, if that's 200, then this is 200, I'd better put negative 1 and negative 5, like, in there and get my microscope out, okay? Don't do that. J just, just make the scales different, okay? You're the boss of this parabola, you can tell it where to go. And those scales don't need to be the same. They just need to be consistent. Okay? So if this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, for instance, when I put this number down here, see this? This is negative 4, or I should say negative 3, negative 4. So here's negative 3 horizontally, and I'm going to go down 1, 2, 3, 4. That's where my vertex is. Okay? Are you happy with that? Now, remember I said your scale has to be consistent. If I'm saying that's 5, then this distance better be roughly similar to this distance. If I say negative 4, like the vertex is up here, I'm busted. Like they're not anywhere comparable to each other. Okay? So this is what I mean by scales being consistent. <coughs> I've got all my clues. I'm ready to go. Um, well, I will put one more thing on there, which is um, the last point we'll put on, the vertex. You should actually put a tiny, tiny horizontal line through it. That seems a bit unusual. You're not going to do it with any of those other points that you did. The reason why is because a very common mistake that students make when they draw these parabolas is they draw them too sharp, right? See my, uh, my shapes here? These are nice curvy parabolas. Lots of people draw their parabolas kind of like that, right? Or even worse, like with a point at the bottom, okay? That is a nice shape. You might learn about it in the next couple of years, but it's not a parabola. It's got to be curved. It's got to come down gently to the vertex, okay? So drawing a horizontal line there, just like I have a little horizontal line here and a little horizontal line there, it kind of forces you to make the shape a little more accurate. It doesn't do everything, but it's pretty close. 
Okay. Ready to go? Now we're just going to join the dots. Okay. I've got um, one, two, three dots going this way, so I'm going to join them up first. It looks like something like this. There we go. Okay. Now, it's worth noting, you know, I mean, admittedly, I did it freehand, but it's pretty common not to nail that on your first step. Okay. Like you've got three dots to hit, and you've got to try and get that shape really nice as well. Please, please, for the love of graphs, draw a pencil, okay? Uh, I know like a small number of people, I can count on one hand, you can draw a perfect parabola first time every time. And the rest of us mere mortals, we have to be willing to make a mistake, fix it up, that's fine. Just rub it out and give it another shot, okay? I've done one side, parabolas are symmetrical, so the other side ought to look exactly the same, just facing the other way. Okay, let's chuck them in. Happy times. I'm finished. Okay. Uh, just to make it really neat, this is not essential, but uh, it'll become more useful later on. I've drawn this. I should label it. It has a name, namely the equation that we started with. Okay. And that's it. The reason why it's important to have an equation there is, as you'll see in about 10 minutes, if you've got more than one graph on here, right? If you've got other shapes colliding with this, you want to know which one's which. So that's why we label them. Okay. Any questions on that explanation of graphing problems? Yeah. Now you put the equation on the top. Yes. Is that like when you're doing an actual graph, and like, not actual graph, like another graph, and you actually have to put like words about? Do you lose a mark if you don't put that up? Pretty much no. Pretty much no. I mean, okay. What are marks about? In a in an assessment, marks are about does this student understand what's going on, right? Uh, a three out of three means yeah, they understand everything. A one out of three is like, well, they understand something. They don't understand nothing, but clearly there are some problems with this. Like, ooh, they put the five as a negative five. That they don't understand the y-intercept or something like that. Okay. So, does this label up here represent an understanding of what's going on? If I've got a graph that looks like this, I think this student understands what's going on. However, the reason I'm still going to put my equation on there is because, as you'll see when I do this, this next part over here, not because it's do I understand or not, but when I have lots of equations flying around, and, and you can bet your bottom dollar when you get into two unit, you will have lots of equations, you will be forced to put multiple graphs on one set of axes, right? You really want to know which one's which, and it will just confuse you when you don't label, right? If you don't label, you're not costing yourself any marks, you're just costing yourself getting confused later on when you're like, wait, which graph is which again? Because you know when you're under pressure, um, you don't have a lot of time. It's it's just too easy to mistake one thing for another. Okay, so it's a lot about marks for me. I think if you've graphed that and everything except the labels on there, you've clearly demonstrated you know what's going on and you've mastered this process. Um, but you should do it. I do it. It helps you. Okay, good question. <laughs>